Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank very sincerely all the organisers of this conference for the excellent conference uh, which you have organised. I'll be as brief as possible so as not to repeat much of what has been said, because clearly many of us are coming from the same uh, perspective and uh, we don't need to repeat what others have said. Um, I come from Ireland, uh, which is a supposedly neutral country, but in recent years we have been dragged in as uh, to the so-called coalition of the willing, which is really more of a coalition of the complicit or a coalition of the guilty. Two and a half million armed US troops have passed through Shannon Airport near where I live on their way to and from the wars in Iraq. Uh, clearly when we are talking about theoretical issues of war and peace, sometimes we tend to forget what war does. As a former military person, and having seen war in the, mil in the Middle East as a UN military peacekeeper, maybe I have a better idea than some of you what a bomb does when it falls. It's not just uh, a nice uh, pyrotechnic show on your television on CNN. It falls on a house, it destroys the house, it kills people instantly, or even worse, it kills people slowly. Children are horribly burned, um, drones are used in places like Afghanistan and in northern Pakistan. They do huge damage. Um, several wedding ceremonies in Afghanistan and Pakistan have been hit by drones, creating havoc, uh, including killing the bride and groom in situations like this. So the havoc that's caused by war, uh, regardless of who starts that war, uh, is not fully understood uh, by m many people in the West in particular who, who have not seen war. People like the Ukraine in particular uh, clearly um, have suffered more than most, not only under Hitler in World War II, but also previously under Stalin. Clearly, they have suffered enough, and it would be dreadful if the current situation in the Ukraine could, should deteriorate in which many lives could be lost. Just maybe getting to the bigger pictures, um, as I see it, we have a number of problems. But a, pr a primary problem is we have a system called international anarchy, whereby the most powerful states in the world, especially those known as the G5, those who have um, on the UN Security Council who have a veto, US, Britain, France, China and Russia, are above international law. Not only have they a veto uh, on what they can do and what others do, but also they have a veto so that the veto can never be changed. And that presents a huge problem in international law. Those five superpowers, or two superpowers, three superpowers possibly, and two smaller states, uh, can do what they like internationally. And in recent times, particularly those involved in NATO, the US, Britain, and France, have been doing what they like internationally. And uh, this is anarchy of the worst type, but clearly um, the so-called humanitarian interventions that they have been involved in uh, have been anything but humanitarian. They have been wars of resources. One might ask very briefly, why should a country like um, Serbia be subject to a war of resource when they have Serbia has relatively little resources like oil. Serbia was a test case, as others have mentioned. Uh, it wasn't for resources, but NATO uh, needed to abandon its original charter, which says they could not intervene except in defense of their own uh, particular members. NATO wanted to abandon the, um, their charter, but also the US and NATO wanted to be clearly seen to be able to act with impunity outside the UN Charter. NATO and the US probably could have and possibly might well have succeeded in getting UN approval for the attack on Serbia, even though that would be very wrong. Uh, but they deliberately did not look for UN sanction because they wanted to operate outside the, the UN to show that they can do whatever they want at that level. Um, and clearly we need, need now to look at how we can overcome that huge problem. The problem with, of international anarchy where effectively we have an organization called the United Nations. We don't have a United Nations. We should probably call that body the so-called United Nations because clearly um, 
Throughout the Cold War, it, it failed. Its primary aim is meant to be international peace. That is the fourth article on its charter. It has failed catastrophically during the Cold War, first of all, to create international peace, but even more so after the Cold War. You had a series of events, Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, the Congo DRC, DRC in particular, where uh, the UN failed catastrophically. It will claim some partial successes, but those successes, uh, small as they were, uh, were only on top of huge failures to prevent conflict, first of all, and then uh, when conflict takes place, to stop it in time. I'm not advocating that uh, but countries should have the right to intervene internationally, but we should have and must work towards creating an international organisation, or even a global organisation, which uh, to which all countries are amenable and uh, over which there should be no vetoes. Uh, I would strongly recommend that we need a system of global jurisprudence, uh, which would include proper international and global laws. The international laws we have at the moment are made primarily, again, by those same superpowers or uh, the most wealthy countries in the world. They make those laws to suit themselves. Um, how we get around the problem of having a hugely flawed United Nations is a very serious problem. Uh, we may need to look very drastically um, at, at how this can be achieved. And it, it may mean literally walking away from the United Nations uh, and creating something different, because the power of veto um, will almost make it impossible uh, for the UN to be reformed. Uh, I've written a PhD thesis on this, which is available on the internet, so, uh, and if anybody wants it, I can uh, uh, give you a copy electronically. But even though I come from a UN background, had been a UN peacekeeper, uh, I had to conclude in my thesis that the UN is beyond reform, and that it needs to be transformed which may be impossible, and if not, it needs to be replaced. And that, to me, was a very depressing conclusion, uh, because I know that there's a huge need for a United Nations. That would be, I suppose, one of my main points. Uh, the, the other point is the issue of neutrality. And clearly, at local level, in places like Ireland, and Ukraine especially, um, the option of not joining military alliances and becoming neutral states uh, is a very important one. Right now, we are seeing countries like Ireland, Sweden, and Finland uh, who are uh, almost abandoning their neutrality. Um, and I would say it's hugely important that uh, countries like Serbia uh, should declare itself to be neutral and maintain neutrality. But also, um, in, the, in Eastern Europe in particular, between Russia and uh, Western Europe, um, we should seek to create a buffer zone of neutral states, right down from Sweden, Finland, the Baltic states, which are already in NATO and which would be hard to extract, um, Belarus and Ukraine, right down to the Black Sea, and if possible beyond that, including countries like Serbia and Bulgaria. I think this is hugely important because that would then, and countries like Ukraine in particular, could then become a bridge uh, economically, socially, and culturally between the East and the West. Likewise, uh, countries like Bulgaria and Serbia, which are located on what is geographically almost the crossroads of the world, again, could become a bridge between the Middle East and Europe and the East. So, um, those are briefly uh, my main points. Um, maybe just to emphasize uh, what can be done um, NATO should have been made redundant in, 19, uh, in the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed. It so far it was ever necessary, at least um, after the end of the Cold War, there was no longer a need for NATO. Yet, 10 Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia and Slovenia, have all joined NATO in the meantime, and there were clearly very serious, almost successful attempts to get both Ukraine and Georgia uh, to join uh, NATO. Uh, 
in more recent years, uh, we hear a lot of criticism of Russia um, in the Western media. The reality is that Russia, in my view, had been behaving quite shrewdly in some respects, and in other respects, uh, quite responsibly. The actions by Russia in persuading Syria to get rid of its uh, chemical weapons uh, was first of all a very astute political move, but also uh, a very genuine humanitarian move in my view, and a very successful move from a point of view of enhancing international peace. Um, rather than go on too long, the talk which I'm giving here is also available on the internet on, the, on our PANA website, www.pana.ie, and also my PhD is available on that if somebody wants to read it. Maybe I'll just finish very briefly by, by quoting uh, um, John Lennon from the, from the Beatles, um, who said something along the lines of, you may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. Yes, I am a dreamer, but we must dream. And also, dreaming is not enough. We must take action to put our dreams into effect. Otherwise, little children in Afghanistan, in Serbia, and elsewhere will be continue to be horribly burned by chemical weapons, by white frost or some whatever, uh, it's up to us in the peace movement to not just to talk and, uh, and dream, but to actually be peace activists and do as much as we can to create peace. Thank you very much.